Kabbalah, Session 6 In the beginning there was no tree of life, and the ten emanations were thought of as concentric ripples, all originating from the same central source. Each ripple represented a breath of God, inhaled and exhaled by the divine creator deity, called modernly the Holy One, blessed be he. It is written that as God inhaled, there was a function called zimzum, or contraction, that was coupled with an expansion, or emanation, as God exhaled each of these first ten sephirot as breaths. Now, if the sephir Yetzirah did originate in its most rudimentary elements with the patriarch Abraham, its system of alpha numerology may date back to an even more primeval epoch, when the first concept of the ten sephirot as ten traits of God may have formed due to or contemporary with the origin for the gesture of supplication, mudra, or hand posture, which today we associate with the act of prayer, in which the two palms are placed together with the prints of the four fingertips and one thumb pad of each hand touching their mere reflected partners, such that five are opposite five. So, at some point very early on in human history, it was reckoned that the ten fingers could be thought of as alike ten traits or aspects describing the divine creator deity. However, initially, these ten traits existed only in a given sequence as a list, either ascending or descending in order, and were still, even by then, not yet associated with the 32 mystical paths of wisdom described ostensibly by Abraham in Sefer Yetzer. At this point, we are given Malkuth, the Hebrew word for kingdom, as a term for the lowest, core-most concept, and Kether, the crown, as the most high affiliated concept. This ideation of a crown over a kingdom may have been borrowed from the earliest Hammurabian and Sargonite era legal codices, establishing the Sumero-Akkadian and ultimately Babylonian empires around 4,000 years ago in about 2000 BC as unions of city-states answering to a single leader. It is known that, in the era of the supposed lifetime of the patriarch Abraham, the Babylonian solar savior deity figure was supplanting all the lesser local god forms, and this usurpation of the elder Anunnaki gods by the upstart rebel god Marduk may have contributed to the reasoning of Abraham for leaving Ur. By the era of the supposed lifetime of the Christian solar savior deity figure, Yeshua HaMashiach, there were two distinct schools on Hebrew mysticism that was already by then called Hokabalah, meaning directly received or whispered teachings. These two were the school preserving the Yosher, or upright, Etzachayim, or tree of life tradition, described by Sefer Yetzirah, and the school preserving the Merkaba, or throne chariot tradition, describing additional aspects of Kabbalah that would later form a pleroma of independent schools surrounding that tree's central trunk, confer the earlier Hekelot literature, and the later Sefer Habahir, Sefer HaZohar, Mishnah, Midrash commentaries, and ultimately feudal era grimoires on ritual magic as well. The throne chariot tradition may be thought of as looking head on at the same axis as the tree of life tradition may be thought of as looking at from along a linear edge. So, entering the current era, we see in the first century AD this division between the throne chariot and the Tree of Life, based schools on Hakabalistic tradition, had already manifested itself 
as two competing classes or secret societies of scribes, the Essenes and the Nazarenes, who preserve two distinct cultures, each based on their half of what we would call the Old Testament scriptures of today. The Essenes kept the Tree of Life Kabbalah, and their scriptures were all those referring to God in them as Yadhevadhe, confer the Book of J or the Yavist, while the Nazarenes kept the Throne Chariot Kabbalah, and their scriptures were all those referring to God in them as Elohim, confer the modern Q Gospel. This split continues today between Christendom under Jesus, Son of Jehovah, and the faith of Islam, meaning surrender in Arabic, taught by Muhammad, peace be upon him, the last holy prophet of Allah. Yitzhak Luria, 1534-1572 A.D., called Ha'ari, meaning the lion, had been a student of Moshe ben Jacob Cordovero Haramak, 1522-1570. To 1570, who was founder of the Spanish Safed school, attempting to reunify these twin traditions. Luria collated from variant manuscripts and published the first complete collected edition of Sefer Yetzera. Because the Tree of Life model of Hakabalah's ten Sephirot emanations is described simply and presumably originally, in this short version of Sefer Yetzer, the diagram we associate with the Tree of Life of HaKabalah cannot, in all truth, be dated prior to this time. Moreover, it would not be until the lifetime of Elijah Vilna Gaon, called Hagra, 1720-1797 A.D., that the simplest, now considered most likely to be the original, version for this diagram was worked out, as we shall examine later, toward the end of this session. Luria's design for the Tree of Life diagram accentuated the distinction between the upper three, or supernal, sephirot from the lower seven, subtended, sephirot. The reasoning for this was mathematical and psychological, associating the lower seven Sephiroth with the more physical worlds of Asaya and Bariah, and the three supernal Sephiroth with the more spiritual worlds of Yetzirah and Etzeluth, thus being closer to the void of Ain, Ein Sof, and Ein Sof Or that supersedes and surrounds the cosmos of the emanations as a shroud of limitless, empty nothingness. To accentuate this distinction, Luria's model for the Tree of Life, ostensibly the first depiction of its kind, featured a sunken metal column with the lowest sephirot, Malkuth, submerged independently from all the rest. The offset this created formed a division between the 7th and 8th Sephirot as attribute traits, such that Kether, Crown, Chakma, Wisdom, and Bina, Understanding, were all encircled as Daath, Knowledge, a separate realm of inner psychological essence, apart from the realms containing the subtended lower 7 Sephiroth, defined by a more external, physical existence. The parallel tradition of the throne chariot, Merkava mysticism school of Kabbalah, had also progressed contemporary to its twin school studying the tree of life. Rabbi Akiva ben Yosef, 50 to 135 AD, or possibly his student, Rashbai Shimeon bar Yochai, whom was said to have hid from Roman occupation in a cave, studying Torah for thirteen years 
before being inspired by the prophet Elijah to return to the world and author the work. Originally initiated the spoken liturgy that would come to constitute the main body of Sefer HaZohar, first published by Moish ben Shemtav, called Moses de Leon, 1240 to 1305. The word Zohar, meaning splendor or radiant light, appears first in HaTorah in Ezekiel 8.2, thus placing it in the Merkava throne chariot tradition. But the detailed descriptions in the Zohar's texts, cosmological content, Book Bereshit, or Beginning, Heart Beth, Hebrew for B, deal with the same essential concept that the Tree of Life diagram attempts to depict, a ladder-like lattice connecting a transcendental heaven above to our mundane earth below. Luria's proposed model for the Tree of Life diagram thus accentuated the Zohar's predilection for the use of a base 7 numerical system. The cosmology of the Zohar attributes six Sephirot-like traits to each of the four worlds, such that, per each of the four Kabbalistic worlds, ascending from most dense to least, Asaya, Bariah, Yetzira, Atzaluth, there are six traits surrounding a central seventh, but such that the first, bottom, and last, top, traits in every level's arrangement bordered on the last or the next in the series of worlds, and thus were only one-half traits apiece. The end result maps a soul's passage in its immediate afterlife past a total of 25 traits or attributes before attaining to the Holy of Holies, wherein God is, according to this text, said to dwell. The goal of this complex methodology is, in the Zohar, clearly stated as being to recapitulate or to reunite the divine creator deity with his bride, called Shekinah, meaning his presence by describing individual souls as like sparks of light rising upward to be absorbed into the clear light of Kether, in the most high presence of the Holy of Holies, in Atzaluth, the divine conceptual realm. Again, by displaying Malkuth in an additionally subtended position, Luria's model for the Tree of Life diagram arrangement of the ten Sephirot traits was attempting to accentuate the fallen nature of mankind's soul and to symbolize the intervening six Sephirot between the kingdom and the inner or psychological worlds of the three supernals as a ladder-like lattice structure. The immediate results of Luria's attempts to manipulate the simpler model proposed later by Hagra were the creation of an unorthodox 11th Sephiroth, Dath, Hebrew for knowledge, and the mythology-fueled subsequent school of study about this slippage of the middle pillar, relating it to the shattering of the shells, or vessels, event, described in its own school of literature as dating back to the earliest Sephiroth and Zimzum, expansion contraction phase of proto-creation. Thus, by his concessions toward the Zoharic school of Kabbalah, Luria's modeling of the Yetziric school Tree of Life diagram ultimately may have done the work's subject more harm than help, although it definitely did accomplish his original goal in designing it as such, to obscure the true model from contemporary Catholic Christians who considered all such study of Kabbalah blasphemy. Because of these concessions with the Zohar, made solely for the reason of obfuscating their meaning from contemporary Christians, there quickly arose manifold differing models to arrange the traits of the 22 foundation letters around the ten luminous emanations. 
These constitute the earliest models of the Tree of Life diagram. The longer term result of Lurie's model was the birth of a school of latter-day Protestant Christian Kabbalists. Appealing to Hermetic alchemists and to Neoplatonists alike during the Renaissance and early Enlightenment eras, the study of Kabbalah became en vogue among the anti-papist intelligentsia. Athanasius Kircher, 1602 to 1680 AD, a Jesuit scholar at the Roman Gregorian College, has been called the last Renaissance man and was a student in many fields, including the study of Kabbalah. Kircher's works, translated into English, may have been the first serious infusion of Kabbalah studies into the Anglo-Saxon sphere during our modern era. Kircher's Kabbalistic models portray a knowledge of both Sefer Yetzirah's 32 mystical paths of wisdom and the centralmost accoutrements from the Zohar's base 7 cosmological descriptions as well. So, just as Hedluria opened up that Pandora's box of Christian Kabbalah, so too did Kircher's works introduce this trend to the modern English-speaking world. In Kircher's diagram, we see the primary difference between the later Christian Kabbalistical model and the earlier truly Hebrew model is that in the Christian and subsequently inspired versions, the paths connecting Yesod, foundation, to Gevorah, severity, and Chesed, mercy, in the original Hebrew models have, in the later Christian models, apparently slipped down to now connect Hod, glory, and Netzach, victory, to Malkuth, kingdom, instead. This final slippage of the middle pillar constitutes the last step in the Lurianic, anti-Christian, obscuration of the true Gra model of the Tree of Life diagram of Hakabalah. The final pre-modern era diagram for the Tree of Life of Hakabalah to consider is called, by Aleister Crowley in his work 777, the Naples Arrangement. This model of Hakabalah as a simple lattice with ten vertices connected by 22 paths, only becomes complex if one attempts to envision these 10 vertices as actual corners and the 22 paths as actually being edges on a materially solid, real-shaped, three-dimensional object. The result of meditations on this model have led to much confusion among the confusable but also to much inspiration to learn more among some, relatively more reasonable by comparison. It is by now generally accepted by Hebrew students of Kabbalah and scholars on the subject from other secular sectors and religious creeds that the shape depicted in the two-dimensional Tree of Life model of Kabbalah is, most likely, a polytope from a higher dimensionality continuum than our own physical reality of three-dimensional space propelled in the singular direction of time. In other words, this form is thought to be a hyperspace shape authentically attributable to ancient inspiration. In our modern era, the Tree of Life diagram of Hakabalah has come to symbolize the 32 mystical paths of wisdom described originally in the Sefer Yetzer but also a litany of other cross-cultural and syncretic symbols as well. Aside from being merely traits or attributes assignable to God, now the ten sephirot are also seen as symbols of the sun, moon, and five other classical planets of antiquity, along with the sphere of the movable heavens being affiliated to Chakma, wisdom, the sphere of the fixed heavens to Kether, crown, and the sphere of the four elements of earth to Malkuth, kingdom.
likewise, aside from being merely associated to the 22 foundation letters. Now the paths on the Tree of Life diagram's shape are each given as an additional visual attribute, a so-called Atu, or trump card, from the alleged Book of Thoth, or Liberty deck of Tarot cards. The most recognizable set of these 22 trump card images was, during the first half of the 20th century, undeniably the Rider Waite deck, designed by members of an occult secret society, ritual magic practice and study group called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. It was Aleister Crowley whom sought, after leaving this group, to publish their secret inner order rituals, and that, by doing so, began the present tacit repeal of the post-Safid, Hasidic-era ban and prohibition against the open, public study of esoteric Kabbalah. The Kabbalah has since become, as Crowley intended it, more or less a blank canvas onto which one may paint whatever religiously syncretic meanings one wishes, from any tradition in the world and from any era of history. So, in our own post-Crowleyan New Age, the study of ancient Jewish mysticism is not kept solely for the initiated and passed down among them only orally any longer. Thus, this Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was responsible for unleashing onto the unsuspecting and unprepared global theater audience, then undergoing intermittent worldwide wars and population explosions in the early 20th century AD, the entirety of what is now politely dubbed simply the Western Esoteric Mystery School Tradition and, insofar as the members of this group were unsuspecting of and unprepared for this outcome themselves, the result of what they released contained many incomplete subsystems, many shorthand notations, and many rushed replications of past errors. In this regard, their contribution to history of an initiatory order, degree system, or hierarchy for intracult promotion that is based however crudely, on the Ten Sephiroth model of a Kabbalah's Tree of Life diagram, cannot be rightly and necessarily included amongst such otherwise rare but malformed rubbish as, for example, their spherical projection model of the Tree of Life. Having been based, in part, on antiquarian cipher manuscripts and, in part, on the Society Rosicruciania in Anglia, the British Rosicrucian branch affiliate to UGLE Freemasonry. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn's basic initiatory format, including seven Outer Order and three Inner Order degrees with rituals, titles, and official duties, etc., was later reapplied by Aleister Crowley in his reformation of the German Order of Oriental Templars, or simply the OTO. Although Crowley proclaimed himself the first to achieve the utmost pinnacle, Ipsissimus, rank in this already by then worldwide invisible college, following his death, the OTO he reformed suffered some interior schisms and splits, but remains using basically the same base 10 degree system now that, in theory, was designed by the founders of the Hermetic Golden Dawn, and which was at the least, inspired by the SRIA. However, Crowley's personal fascinations led him toward the study of the dark arts as well, and thus he found and cultivated the Tree of Death diagram, or model of Hakabalah. This diagram of my own shows Crowley's attributions to the reversed and adverse Cliffoth the hidden or concealed courtesies behind the visible Sephiroth emanations of ten demon kings over seven hells, and is shown parallel to descriptions of the denizens of hell given by Crowley from chapter First Resh in Liber Ararita. Crowley describes the king demon over all the rest, 
called Satan Moloch in this arrangement, as the twin heads that ever battle against one another, so that all their thought is confusion. The shattering of the vessels event is described in its own small school of Kabbalistic literature, associating it with the Zimzum contraction as God breathes in, with the separation between the four worlds of Kabbalah, and with the Klifoth, Hebrew for shells, vessels that contain the ten Sephirot emanations prior to the event of their shattering. Supposedly, according to this tradition, the shards of these shattered shells were sewn downward and becoming increasingly more solid, dense, and material as they descended, sank from the spiritual realm to comprise the fundamental substance of all matter. Hence, the difference between a golem and a man, such as, say, Adam, whom, we are told, in scripture, was, like a golem may be, made out of clay, is that a golem is like an empty shell, and man, or Adam in this case, is imbued with the breath of God, igniting an innate, even if dormant, divine spark of inspiration. Thus, it is also speculated, the shattering of the shells occurred to provide mankind a solid, base nature in which to ensnare and entrap such a divine spark of light or luminescence, which Hebrews call Ruach, and which Christians call a soul. So what finally is Hakabalah, and what is the meaning of its Tree of Life diagram? If we can confidently assert, as we may, that Isaac Luria's contribution of the original Tree of Life diagram to our current era was initially intended as subterfuge and as a means of sabotaging future scholastic researchers from ascertaining the concealed, correct interpretation or mystical truth behind it, then we may add to this assertion that his depiction of the Tree of Life is thus not only arbitrary and alterable, but actually outright wrong on purpose. Although technically satisfying the requirements for the Tree of Life model described in the text of the Sefer Yetzera, that it have ten corners or emanations, and twenty-two edges or paths connecting them, Luria's diagram is, ultimately, an impossible shape to model in three dimensions, and should be considered a fallen and imperfect example of this model to start with. As mentioned before, a later version, offered by Elijah ben Solomon Zalman, whom was called the Vilna Gaon, or simply Hagra, proposes a simpler structural lattice framework supporting the same amount of 32 mystical paths of wisdom as described in the text of Sefer Yetzirah, and is, in all likelihood, more authentic and in keeping with the original shape intended to be inferred via its verbal descriptions therein. The primary difference between the Tree of Life diagram as modeled by Ha'ari and that suggested by Hagra is that, while the RE diagram depicts an impossible shape, that cannot be modeled in three-dimensional space. The Gras version of the same model depicts a shape that can easily be modeled as existent in three-dimensional space. In this case, the original shape of Kabbalah's Tree of Life diagram is revealed as being a cube over a cube, or one cube squared. Thus, if a cube has six sides or faces, eight corners or vertices, and twelve legs or edges, and a tesseract, or cube cubed, has twelve sides, sixteen corners, and twenty-four edges. The original model for the Tree of Life of Hakabalah can be said to have had ten exposed sides, twelve corners, and twenty edges. When looked at from a 45-degree angle, a double cube, 
or a single cube raised by one exponent to symbolize the motion of the object over time comprises a model with five exposed faces, ten exposed corners, and twenty legs, twelve horizontal, eight vertical. Although this naked symbol, the double cubit hypercube at antipode of Hakabalah, may be thought of at this point as alike a more or less blank slate or empty canvas, onto which we will next be arbitrarily assigning any sets of symbols we may like. This should not preclude the idea that a certain right order for any set of symbols must exist even if, at first, it may be lost among an ocean of wrong and arbitrary assignations. So, with that caveat, what I will present next from here to the close of this session will be my own attributions of sets of symbols to this lattice framework shape, and these should be seen as the work of a turn-of-the-21st-century researcher of Hakabalah attempting to recreate the most probable original format for the Tree of Life diagram model. In short, these may each, and or all, be wrong, even if only in some very slight way, and none of them should be thought of as necessarily standing as a conclusion for this line of inquiry. So here we may see the twin upper and lower cubes unfolded into their Calvary cross tiling pattern, with the inferior cube on the right presented as the inverse cross, and the superior cube on the left depicted as the upright cross. Beyond this, the twelve horizontal legs are given as the twelve signs or houses of the zodiac round, while the eight verticals are as the seven classical planets of antiquity, with Mercury alone appearing twice, once on each cube. Although in this depiction the twelve sides or faces of the twin cubes are given as the six fundamental questions of logical reasoning, who, what, where, when, why, and how, these assignations are my own and arbitrary and may just as well be left blank entirely. If one removes the six fundamental questions of reasoning from the twelve sides of the two cubes, the result appears as a pair of cubes comprised of solid legs or edges, but with entirely missing faces and both hollow in their centers. In this depiction of such a model, where the twin cube's legs are solid, but the faces and volumes of both are left empty, we see the upper cube separated from the lower cube, but we may also see from this vantage point that the upper cube's lowest legs and the lower cube's topmost legs share the same symbols. This is to signify that these legs, or horizontal edges, are shared jointly by both cubes, fusing and connecting them into a new, single shape, where the six faces, eight corners, and twelve edges of a single cube, when doubled into the twelve faces, sixteen corners, and twenty-four edges of a pair of cubes, may be joined together to form a shape with ten faces, twelve corners, and twenty edges, the so-called Tree of Life of Hakabalah, visualized as a solid model in three-dimensional space. Therefore, if we can assert, as we may, that the Gra arrangement of the ten Sephiroth traits onto the Tree of Life diagram lattice framework is authentically very ancient in origin, and may have even been known to our earliest Homo sapien ancestors, we may desire to inquire as to the six logical questions in reasoning out the who, what, where, when, why, and how of its origins Thus, who first invented or discovered a Kabbalah? What was their intention for it to be? Where and when was this innovation originally achieved? Why was the Tree of Life diagram of a Kabbalah designed as it is? And finally, how is its design best modeled? 
the earliest model relating a symbol set of 22 to any kind of lattice framework structure was probably developed during the later part of the Paleolithic and early part of the Neolithic eras when mankind had spread out globally as a coastal, seafaring civilization, but had just begun to spread inland and develop stone hunting tools for pursuing wild herds of mega mammals during the last North Hemisphere Ice Age. This places its likely date of origin some 12,500 years before now, or around 10,500 BC, and its likely location of origin probably in Oceania, the islands of the southwestern Pacific. At that time there, a game, now called Cat's Cradle, was invented involving looping a string around one's fingers a certain number of times following a certain pattern of gestural mudras to arrive at a widely varied array of differently appearing results. One of these such string figure outcomes involves a single loop that has been curled up around itself a total of 22 times to display an array that is similar in appearance to the Gra version of the Tree of Life diagram of Hukabalah. The relation of Hukabalah to this admittedly extremely ancient game form remains, however, speculative at best, and, again, contemplations in this regard should not be seen as either definite or conclusive. However, since this relationship may be seen as being purely speculative, let me close this session by examining something about this model that cannot be said to be merely coincidental. If we can, as we may, depict the Gras arrangement of the Tree of Life diagram of Hukvala as a lattice framework onto which we may then assign the 32 mystical paths of wisdom, these being the 10 Sephiroth traits and the 22 foundation letters, then we may, as we may also see here, assign to this same Gras-based arrangement the English transliterations and translations of these ten Sephiroth traits derived from their original Hebrew, and the substitution cipher of replacing the 22 foundation letters on their paths between these with the 12 signs or houses of the zodiac round, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces, the seven classical planets of antiquity, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and the three alchemical states or phases, salt, sulfur, and quicksilver. Given these symbols decryption, from a purely symbolic set back into their original Hebrew alphabetic format, we find the reminder that each Hebrew letter was also equal to a number sum in the context of alphanumeric gematria encoding. Here we see that, just as each symbolic sign attributed to the 22 paths or formation letters could be peeled back to be replaced with a Hebrew letter so too can these same Hebrew letters be substituted for by numeral sums, and these, when added together, as in the case of the Hebrew words assigned as the ten Sephiroth traits, combined to form larger number sums. Thus, just as each of the twenty-two symbolic signs has its own corresponding Hebrew foundation letter on its same fixed path on the Gra Tree of Life diagram, and so each Hebrew letter has its own alphanumeric number sum. So too does each of the ten Sephiroth traits have a corresponding gematria number sum, and each of these has, in turn, its lowest common denominator and greatest common factor components. For example, the factor of 2 to the 4th equals 8 
occurs twice on the graphic as a denominator within the gematria for Malkuth, kingdom, and Yasad, foundation. And, likewise, the factor of five occurs in three cases, inside of Yasad, foundation, Hod, splendor, and Kether, crown, and so on and so forth. In the final diagram to be considered for this session, let us pause to examine this depiction of my own design, revealing what amount to entirely inherent relationships between these anciently given traits. Here we see the two is color-coded purple, three indigo, five blue, the exponent four yellow, the exponent three orange, and the exponent two red, while all other numbers reduced to primes are given in green. We can also see the paths connecting these color-coded number sums are color-coded according to the same key, such that a blue arrow connects each occurrence of the number 5 to every other, a green arrow every odd prime sum to every other, etc. And the result of this is that, although none of the connections between these number sums would require violating the Gras arrangement shape, Five of the legs serve as at least double connections between relevant sums, and six of the possible paths on the Gras tree remain unused, left blank. Further conclusions we can find from this arrangement include that the Kamatria sums of both Bina, understanding, and Chakma, wisdom, are automatically prime numbers, and that with Tifereth, beauty, they comprise a supernal quaternion that is connected to the six other subtended traits only by the single path joining Kether to Yesod, connecting their base five prime number sums.